Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to Plaid's Tech Talk series. Uh, really excited to be here today. We're going to talk about the road to real-time payments uh, in the United States. And uh, my name is John Anderson. I support the payments team here at Plaid. And uh, I'm super stoked to be uh, here together with some fantastic folks that I learn from as I think about payments uh, in the U.S. Uh, to hear sh and share what we're uh, what we're working on together. So I'm here with Lily Verone from Forrester and Akash Desai from Novo. Lily, give us a little bit more about your background. Yeah, so I'm an analyst at Forrester. I do research on payment strategies, payments acceptance strategies, mostly around merchants and billers accepting payments from consumers, um, but tracking all the changing, ever-changing landscape of of all things payments. And Akash? Yeah, thank you for that, J.A. Um, so my name is Akash. I'm a group product manager within the financial services business uh, at Novo. Novo is a powerfully simple fintech platform for small businesses. And, and my goal is uh, to build the best products to help these businesses centralize their finances and uh, speed up their cash flow. Very cool. Uh, and again, uh, Lily has taught me so much about, uh, really about the, the world of billing and, uh, and Akash, uh, I've already learned so much just in uh, warming up for this uh, discussion. So thank you guys again so much for being here. All right, so uh, today we are gonna be covering uh, three topics and kind of go through a little bit of a history flow here. We're gonna start with where we are today in real-time payments and in payments in general. Um, and for them, uh, then we're gonna move into kind of what we see emerging here in 2023, particularly with the arrival of some of the new rails. Uh, and then it wouldn't be a payments discussion without addressing fraud, which is always a part of the picture and in, in what, of what we see in, in a lot of the innovation across uh, the different teams that we're working with. Um, so uh, let's start out with where we are today. Um, this is a really cool slide here uh, that really talks about the growth that we're seeing effectively in, in bank payments. Um, and, uh, you know, ACH, which has been around since the 60s, um, is uh, an incredibly robust and at this point, extremely large uh, way that uh, so many companies and individuals are moving money. And what's amazing that I just see, like on the left-hand side, you see um, that just ACH continues this growth, already getting up to like over $30 billion. And that just like the annual growth rates, even, you know, over 20% is uh, is really, really mind-blowing. Um, and then in particular, you see same-day ACH, which came online really uh has like over doubled every uh, on, on a year on year basis. So we're seeing huge growth there. And um, and on the right hand side, uh, we talk about like uh, RTP, which is the clearinghouses, a real time payment uh, model. Um, we'll, we'll get a little bit uh, more into that later in terms of how that rail actually works. But again, the same thing here, you can just see like this chart actually just shows quarterly growth and uh, already, already up to 52 million transactions, over 25 billion. Um, of volume, which is a big number, but it's still only like uh, less than a point uh, or a percentage point of, of overall ACH. Um, but again, the growth levels, like if you just look at like quarter on quarter basis, five or 8% um, is uh, super exciting. Uh, Lily, I'm going to start with you. Like what, what are you seeing on, on, on both these rails and like, what's the growth trajectory that you see these on? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that the, a lot of the ACH space, especially, you know, in my space where I cover kind of merchants um, getting consumers to pay for the products or services that they're offering. The ACH network or the ACH processing has always been this, this um, kind of merchant, uh, merchant stick in the, you know, expectation or desire to use lower cost processing rather than paying, you know, the credit card or interchange fees. So it's been this, not because it's good for the consumer necessarily, or not because it's the best, most you know frictionless experience for everyone involved, but because you know it's a very cost-driven initiative, and and they've um, they've often mandated it right in some industries, especially in the bill pay industry, it's sort of like this way or no way at all. Um, so so there's it's definitely got its foothold in very you know in various industries and but I think and well I, I think we're going to talk about this right I think that we still have um, growth even for sort of traditional HCH processing in a lot of industries. Yeah, but I mean, speaking of which, like Akash, what are you guys saying? Yeah. Um, so, so two things. One, if you look at the business to business payments, you you start to see uh, that continued growth on the ACH rails as people move away from the traditional checks and, and different methods of payment uh, to more digital. Um, 
So we're definitely seeing that. And then the second is from the RTP side of the house, you know, so many of these SMBs bank at a lot of these 11,000 financial institutions in the US, right? But this is a completely new payment rail. Uh, and that means these institutions have to build out the technology to allow for this money movement to happen. And so, you know, when you're at a credit union compared to one of the larger institutions, it's hard to even have access to this from, a, from an SMB perspective. So um, once it is available, I do see that changing. Sure. You know, one of the things on this slide I see is like, if you, if you take a look at this green uh, chunk on the left-hand side and the consumer bill pay piece, you know, it's like, it's kind of hidden there, but you can see like, particularly like going from 2021 to 2022, you just see that it's like a hugely growing piece of the overall share. I mean, really, this is what you study and Akash, your customers must be seeing the same kind of growth of bill pay demand as well, right? Yeah, I mean, but the, the bill pay, especially through sort of banking portals and things like this have existed in since the 90s. Uh, and, and, but the pandemic certainly drove, I think, you know, either uh, in some cases, you know, for bill pay, it was those laggards, those folks who had avoided, um, you know, the the kind of uh, digital bill pay experience, they finally got on board for this, you can even see the sort of P2P sliver showing up there, finally being visible, um, where there's, these experiences, you know, we, we saw a lot of people finally in the pandemic, exploring these, these sort of digital bill pay and digital payment experiences for the first time. Um, and, and in some of the kind of, you know, established industries, it was getting those laggards. And in some of these, you know, newer use cases, like in retail and in, um, and in other industries, it's, it's finally getting kind of, you know, um, those early adopters or getting to critical mass, depending on the use case. Yeah. yeah and then on our end, I mean, SMBs at the end of the day use so many different tools, a lot of these being digital tools that require them to, to do bill pay um, to really much you know, manage their business. And so there's two things, right? One is so many businesses are still self-employed. So you have people that are consumers running businesses as SMBs, so their preferences are one and the same. And so definitely seeing both of these charts growing the same way uh, across both parties. Cool. All right. Well, the you know, the big question is uh, the, the consumer is the driver uh, of this. And so one of the things we do at Plout is we, we really are maniacal about the consumer experience and the consumer expectations and, and where, where they're leading us is, uh, you know, as an ecosystem. And, uh, you know, are they ready to adopt the new technologies or the new ways of, of moving money if, if given the chance? And this is like a recent, uh, recent data we pulled back on some of our own uh, research and um, was just like, really mind-blowing how high these numbers were in terms of consumer readiness to start to use a bank rail for a lot of the money moving here. Obviously, like bill pay showed up as the highest use case um, and it kind of makes sense, right? Consumers are, are used to it. Um, a lot of bills today have, and uh, billers today, you can probably talk about this in a little bit, like have the incentives set up to like pull people along on this. Um, but we see some things, you know, subscriptions a little bit lower. And when we dug into some of that data, we found that it was certain type of subscriptions kind of pulling that demand a little bit lower. Obviously, account funding is now becoming more and more a day-to-day -day part of people's lives. You know, in, if you look back in history, account funding was something people did maybe once every year, maybe as they were setting up a new account or setting up a new loan. And now with embedded finance, fintech showing up in everybody's kind of day-to-day -day life, whether it's a pre keep with a, uh, a merchant or uh, some of the newer fintech apps that people are using or different types of banks that people use to manage their money in a more sophisticated way. People do account funding more and more. And that's a super high demand use case, you know, and still early on um, some early on, on like uh, point of sale, like retail, right? Where you see like friction becoming a bigger, uh, bigger issue for people, but still 25% of people being uh, keen to uh, use a bank as a, as a method of payment. Even that really was a surprisingly high number for us on our side. Lily, you want to jump in and share more about what you're seeing on the consumer demand side? Yeah. Well, I think that it's, it's funny because historically, I mean, this lays out very logically for me, right? Like, I think that the the bill pay is very clearly a, a more well-established experience for using bank-based payments. But even in, uh, you know, in subscriptions, you might even think of a, hey, my mobile carrier, right, is, is maybe it's a bill pay experience, but it could also be kind of considered a subscription. And, um, and then you, oops, sorry, the dog's in the background. But even in retail, right, we start to see sort of, um, particularly with like challenger brands and some of these smaller brands using the moment to say, hey, 
we're a small business or a smaller business. Um, every cent, every penny, every you know, everything counts. We are encouraging you to use bank-based payments because it's cheaper for all of us and we'll pass through some of those incentives over to you. And so you, you know, it's almost this amalgam of cost savings for the merchant, but also, you know, um, you know, sort of tapping on the shoulder of the con the values-based consumer that is, you know, we know is growing this day these days too. And so I, I, I anticipate this you know, this is really promising data. We've even seen, I think, for for consumers buying sort of footwear and retail and 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 apparel, you know, six percent of consumers have said they used bank debit for for one of those uh, you know product purchases in the past. And so I think that there's there's an emerging category there, emerging sort of willingness for consumers, even in these use cases that maybe you know, weren't tradition where that behavior isn't traditionally established, we, we start to see some openness or willingness to do to do this for various motivations. Yeah. Okay, Ash, how does the consumer demand and the consumer experience kind of play into your customers and also how how that what what does that mean for you guys and Novo? Yeah, that's a great question. Um like at the end of the day, businesses are essentially dealing with other businesses who at some point are dealing with consumers. And so the demand is uh, absolutely there, whether it's B2B or B2BC. Um, and so these demands are bridging the gap between what they see in their normal lives. And uh, they're expecting these platforms uh, to have those same solutions. Um, and so what's the biggest difference is I feel like businesses are gonna be ready if the platforms they use are ready to accommodate this sort of change. Uh, the adoption is, is one thing, uh, but the second is the implementation of it. And uh, something we've noticed about our, our SMBs is make it easy, right? I'm happy to use the cheapest possible option because I need to run my business, but make it easy to make a bank payment. Um, you know, there's in the consumer space, you have your email address and your phone number. That's very hard to do in the business space. Um, and so when we start to have bank payments in the, you know, the future to include those functionalities, as long as we make it easy, people will adopt it. Sure, we're definitely seeing that. Um, okay, so, you know, despite the robust robustness of, of ACH and, and really the coverage of 100% uh, and the scale of, of how broadly it's being used. Um, one of the challenges that our customers have always kind of, kind of pushed us on is like, is the uncertainty they have to deal with in terms of funds arrival. Even if you're using same day ACH, there's a, like an indeterminate time about when that arrives. Um, and that creates a, such a, a huge amount of risk and uncertainty for our customers. And they're faced with this like really tricky decision of like, do they make, so if, if, if one of their consumers is funding an account or buying, a, you know, purchasing something, do they make that value or uh, available to the consumer immediately and give that real time fulfillment to people? Or do they make, the, and it, it, but doing so actually incurs some level of a risk of, of whether or not those funds will actually show up or if they there's a return that shows up. So I could take the risk and, put, and, and make the money available to people or they have, uh, have to make people wait. Um, and and pend those funds, and uh, oftentimes consumers at that point will like churn out, or they they're not satisfied with the product they're getting, and this has put our customers in a in a tough place historically. And so they came to us asking for help. About a year ago, we started playing around with some of our larger customers about uh, looking into ways that we could use uh, the underlying uh, data within the Plaid network to uh, give our our customers the ability to accelerate the funds availability. We launched a product called Signal, which is a machine learning risk engine. It's powered by the Plaid network and allows our customers to get a higher certainty uh, about the funds availability. The, the, the results on that have been just like unbelievable. We have a customer called Uphold, uh, which is a digital asset market uh, marketplace. And they were able to do two things at the same time, which as a risk person in my past life, like, I couldn't believe like on one hand, they were able to accelerate funds. So 80% of the funds now are available instantly uh, on their platform while also reducing risk. They dropped their, their losses by like 73%. And so what's really happened, if you kind of step back and look at this on a broader scale, we've able, been able to help our customers uh, synthetically cre or create a synthetic real-time rail on top of ACH. And, uh, and again, these results are like, they're proving true in, in many different uh, use cases, whether it's like instant account funding and store value, 
but also in cases, uh, even in like uh, pay by bank uh, use cases where now all of a sudden the, the ACH rail can, from a merchant's point of view, start to actually operate and feel akin to what they're used to with, say, a, a card platform. And so we're really in this interesting world where like a lot of people like to talk about the the, the upcoming real-time rails. And we, we'll talk about those. But even today, we're seeing the existing rails start to behave in uh, in a real instant, uh, instant way. And like, I think Lily, or actually Akash, we'll start with you. Like, does, do you see this showing up with your customers? What are some of the problems that are seeing in terms of like availability of funds on ACH and, uh, and what keeps them up at night on this? Yeah, of course. Uh, so for everyone's benefit, like most SMBs don't even have like more than two weeks worth of working capital. So they're checking their account balance, like constantly, right? Every dollar matters and a lot of decisions that they're making. And so this creation of like, making sure their account balance is the most accurate for them to make the most accurate decision for their SMB uh, to run their business uh, is super important. And so it's that little feeling, right? Like I'm making a payment to JA, that money should debit my account immediately so that I know that every dollar is accounted for. Or, hey, I'm going to debit my external account to credit my Novo account I need to know that that money is going to come in there so that I know I can account for it, right? And so we're definitely seeing this uh, experience, but the moment it starts moving as instant as we would all love it to, uh, people will definitely benefit from the guessing game to be out of the picture. Yeah, yeah. I, I, well, it's, it's interesting because a lot of this, you know, merchants have, and, and billers have obsessed over credit card optimization and pay, credit card payments optimization um, about, you know, failures and how to treat them and when to route them again and how to, and the same attention hasn't historically been focused on ACH optimization. And I think now, um, you know, now there's some more attention being spent on on how to, you know, authenticate a user, how to make sure that there's funds in that account before you, you hit it, and and all of this kind of this this lens of optimization is finally being put around around ACH processing, um, that historically has hasn't been there. And I think that one of the other things that is really interesting is that a lot of this sort of synthetic real time. Um, start setting customer expectations for real, real time, right? This is what makes um, sort of surveying people about real time payments really difficult because distinguishing between what is actually real as we might call it, right? RTP versus uh, what they think is real time um, because the messaging can be real time is really hard to get at the at this. So the more, you know, the more optimization we get around this and immediacy is one of the one of those optimization levers, the more we'll see customers and 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 users kind of expect actual real time and more and more use cases. So I think that this is a really interesting indicator of the moment in time we're in um, that will drive sort of more demand for for real time, um, uh, eventually. I mean, well, it's, I really, really love this concept that you're describing. It's like a flywheel, right? You've got like consumer expectation and demand, like the first slides we had, right? Consumers are starting to ask a little bit more for bank. They're like looking for it. And then that's causing you know, the businesses to start to think about and, and really pay to your point, like pay more attention to, to ACH. And then through that, they're actually starting to bend and, and pull and like, hack and in, in, in a really positive way, build ACH into being a, a better experience for people. They work with companies like Plaid and, and, and Nova also in, in creating a better user experience, which then increases the consumer demand for that, which like brightens the lights on, on bank payments in general um, to, to really create this like positive flywheel of how it's working together. And then on top of that, we see now the the emerging element of, of RTP and like, which is just now like showing up and creating this like this essence, like one more kind of thrust on, on the flywheel. And so again, as, as that starts to show up, so we started to see RTP show up at this point, along with that user experience, it's like magical um, and, the, and the demand from the consumer. And we're seeing those use cases like come together. So uh, just recently Plaid launched uh, a product uh, called Instant Payouts. We, we built it with our transfer platform, which is kind of a full stack service for Plaid customers to be able to connect bank accounts make sure those connections are solid, and then also move uh, the money for that. And then we layered on top um, our first evolution with the real-time rails with adding real-time payments on it to allow our customers to do a, an, inst an instant payout. And so Akash, you were talking about like 
like payroll being like a, like a super important emerging use case. We've started to see this. One of our earlier customers on uh, for this product is a company called My Brand Forest, right? They are a gig platform which allows people to work in retail jobs. And one of the most important differentiators now that they're able to offer in part by using this product is allowing people to go do their gig work and then get payments uh, very instantly for, for the work that they're doing. And when you think about what that means for the consumer, again, they're able to take that money instantly and, and use that. Maybe it's to pay down a loan or, or deploy that capital. Um, Akash, I'll go back to you. Like, are you seeing other cases where you're seeing the instant payout start to play through in some of your customers' use case? So much um, where, you know, if you think about the SMB, they're earning money and then, you know, they're getting paid and then they need to make payments. Um, without a world of RTP, you can never do both it feels like without enough balances on the same day. And so you see so many of our SMBs um, earning money, let's just say on an e-commerce platform for their, where they're selling their products. It's gonna take a couple of days for that money to hit their Novo account. And then a couple of days uh, using the traditional rails to actually pay their vendors, their contractors. Now imagine a world where all that can happen in the same day, right? They're looking for that type of cash flow so they can continue to reinvest into their business. And, and that's where Novo is kind of stepping up and, and hoping for rails of RTP to do that. And I think the, the other one that comes to mind a lot is you have businesses who need to go into the weekend, possibly purchasing inventory, et cetera, but that funding that they were attempting to do to be able to make those purchases had to be timed, but they don't understand cutoff times, right? Not every business is worried about that. So like the ability to do that in the moment to then go and make that purchase changes the game for them um, that they never, ha never had before. I, I love this conversation around real time because it's, it's a story of like technology getting in the way because m more you know, when we talk about payments in the real world, often those are instant, right? I'm giving you cash, you give me the thing. Um, it is only not real time because we have put all of these processes in the way. Um, we're getting out of our own way now with these real, you know, real time payments. And and so it in those use cases where, you know, money um, it, it, where where you have to give, you know, disperse money to someone because at this point, right, RTP is about about crediting only, um, you know, where you have to disperse money to someone and the, that person, that entity um, can can make moves or depend on that outside of, of these arbitrary sort of batch processes or, or business hours. Um, it starts to be really, really, really interesting. Um, and, and all of these kind of use cases are emerging, right? I think payroll we talked about is a really, really interesting one. The, the gig economy, certainly, right? We hear about kind of funding, um, uh, prepaid cards or virtual cards, funding accounts, um, virtual accounts and, and real accounts with with instant funds for those workers in the right balances, you know, the, the just right kind of um, values for them to kind of do their job in this marketplace. Um, and and I think for, for merchants and some of those use cases where, you know, we the merchants are probably like retailers and brands, those who might filter to that bottom um, half of that bar graph we saw earlier of kind of the consumer appetite for these things. They're even looking at, at RTP for uh, refunds and warranties, right? This idea to say, hey, oh, customer service mishap. Let me put money in your pocket right now to make it better. Um, let, let's, you know, not wait for my call center to, to, to get bogged down by all of these calls about where my money is and why my bill isn't paid or why it let's just kind of um, do away with that. And that's, that's a lot of, I think what's, what'll be interesting when we see sort of debiting being allowed um, coming down the pike, but, but um, in, in those use cases where that money being in the account of the customer or that entity or, you know, um, whether it be a consumer or a business, where they could use that money immediately, where you know technology has just gotten in the way of them operating because we've taken the real world, real time away from it by digitizing it essentially, um, you know that that disappears here, and so that's where we start to see the use cases kind of getting more and more interesting. Is says, oh, there's there's this one I could use it, and maybe I have a a kind of loyalty program, and I'm giving credits or other things like this in in real time for uh, for my customers and kind of increasing, making my product or service um, stickier because 
because that immediacy actually drives um, material benefit to the customer in that in that use case. There's so I'm going to jump in really quick. I think that was that was perfect, Lily. Uh, when you think of countries like Brazil and India, for example, like UPI or PIX, right? I've seen it in both countries. You walk up to a merchant, you pull up your QR code, you're able to pay them, and then JA go into your concept of the flywheel. Like, wow, consumer to essentially the merchant, the merchant can then go and pay someone else, that can go pay someone else, that can pay for a cab and go do something else. Like the number of e-commerce transactions that are gonna to continue to happen or just transactions in general is faster because now we've created that capability. There's just so much goodness that we see, right? Whether it's like just out of pure, pure like moral conviction and honestly responsibility, consumers need their money. And it's our job to get it to them. And that like, they worked hard for it. You know, I, one of our customers uh, does uh, HELOCs and consumers are like, when, when, when you're going Perfect to deposit, mm -hmm. it's a pretty emotional, heavy decision for you. You're making a big commitment. You're filling out a lot to apply for that loan. You're committing yourself to something in the future. Clearly you've got something, whether it's a, a remodel or something really important in your life, you're funding. And 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 then it, this customer is like, yeah, the worst thing ever is like we issue the money, but like it's kind of we don't know when it's going to arrive when we send it through ACH. It's like, yeah, there's a carrier pigeon on its way with your HELOC. Well, like let us know when it arrives. So what happens then is the consumers call the call center over and over again, multiple times a day, saying, hey, is the money here? Is the money here? It hasn't arrived. And in, in in a historical world in the past days, first of all, the 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 company didn't know when it would arrive, um, and then second of all. You know, they 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 really didn't know what to say, and so you know those companies are working with Plot on on two dimensions. First of all, they can issue a real time payout, so it's like just instantly, and they know like as part of the RTP, hit the next second like with with the rails themselves, they know it arrives. Second of all, with a Plot integration, we can help them know actually definitively what moved on the balance, and so that that company not only is able to like give the the consumer honestly what they deserve and be a, a, a more joyful experience and, and something important to their life. Second of all, they're actually able to like save costs. They don't need a huge team of people answering the phone call now that it's on an automated thing. All right, we're gonna, yeah. we're gonna continue to move into the future here uh, and talk about uh, what's next. So the rails. So this is a, such a special year in 2013. You know, Again, let's go back to the flywheel, right? The consumers are starting to shift demand uh, and like really show up looking for for a great bank experience. They're getting it and they want more. The companies are starting to to be aware of that and optimizing and, and build um, these synthetic real time experiences. And then now the the rails are actually starting to arrive. We talked about the clearinghouse starting to scale up um, uh, with its RTP. And then I think the enthusiasm. I was just at uh, Nacha uh, recently and at the conference. Like everybody's talking about the arrival of Fed and giving uh, even greater choice to to the ecosystem and. And it's super exciting to to see that come out. And I think in the past that was a lot of a lot of industry pundits were thinking about uh, the future rails, but now they're actually here. And and that just is creating a, a, yet another layer on flywheel. People believing like it's not oh the rails will someday show up. Like the rails are going to show up in in just a, a few weeks, or they're already here. And so just to walk through just a couple things um, on the mechanics of the different rails um, for folks like learning about how this is going to come come through. Um, uh, ACH, I think most people know historically has been operated by the Fed and TCH. And then we have two real-time uh, options for people. Uh, so one is the RTP uh, product operated by the Clearinghouse. The second is uh, FedNow, soon to come out with uh, the Fed. It's the first launch in, in 50 years. So it's it's really exciting to, to cheer for them as, as that comes through. Um, on the settlement time, you know, we talked about ACH having like this indeterminate settlement time, particularly tricky on like weekends or holidays. RTP and FedNow are both identical to 24-7, 365. Super important. That is foundationally what we mean by real time. It truly is real time. Um, uh, bi-directional, so ACH is obviously bi-directional today. RTP and FedNow are, are, are really, at the moment, really anchored on, on nailing this new rail on the payout side. We will see pay-ins, uh, you know, over time. But, you know, for every every consumer purchase and, and uh or, and pay in that happens in the entire ecosystem. There's a payout, an equal payout. So I think there's a lot of work for the whole ecosystem to work on uh, with what we have right now in payouts. Um, revocability is a huge topic. We'll probably talk about that a little bit more, particularly in the context of, of fraud. The coverage is something that comes up a lot with folks that we talk to. You know, obviously ACH uh, today has full coverage. You know, 
some some folks, you know, challenge uh, the RTP network. Hey, it's only got like eight sixty five percent coverage. Um, that's actually sixty five percent of institutions, but it's a higher a higher part when you actually look at the underlying consumer accounts that are actually connected through that. And then the Fed is only going to bring uh, more banks to this. So we do think that with like ACH as a baseline, and then RTP and Fed now on top of on top of that, there's going to be adequate choice and high likelihood of a real time option coming online, whether it's through one of the real or kind of synthetically made available to uh, through through uh, like things like uh, Signal. Um, that was a that was a mouthful. I think getting into some of the mechanics. Uh, Akash, do your customers ask a lot about this? What are some of the questions that they have, and and where do you, you know, see the mechanics of the different rails and their arrival kind of play through? Yeah, it's an interesting question because a lot of SMBs are essentially asking, "Where is my money, and how fast can you move it?" And the rail to them is not of importance, but what is the most of importance to them is coverage, right? They want to make sure their payments are successful. They want to make sure the money is moving is successful. And a lot of SMBs and, and just businesses in general get lost when you hit them with an error message, right? They don't know what an alternative could look like if the platform doesn't provide it. And so coverage here is, is super key. Um, and then, yeah, I know you mentioned bi-directional, we'll get to it in a second, is, is going to be something they ask for. How can I ask for money to come into my account faster um, compared to me just pushing it out? Really? Yeah. Well, and like everything else, I mean, I think with with on the merchant or biller side, thinking about payments, everything is additive. We very rarely kind of let go or retire anything. And as we saw with ACH, there's so much activity with the traditional kind of ACH processing that that this is not going to be, you know, um, a, a goodbye. So, you know, it, it's not a farewell story for that at all. Um, so what we have here is more and more options are great, but it means, you know, um, decisions have to be made. And I think that what we'll see here is a lot more options for intermediaries to kind of make those decisions on behalf of, of the merchants or billers where they, they want to get, you know, they look for payment partners to make those decisions for them. They want it to be informed. They want to know why they want the rationale, but they don't need to make that decision. They depend on experts to make those decisions for them. So what I think what we'll see here is a lot more, you know, activity around um, intelligence gathering, data management, routing potentially, right, D depending on um, coverage and, and you know, uh, success and performance on in particular use cases. So all the stuff potentially that we see and hear and talk about for orchestration and routing and, you know, in payments optimization will apply here too, given the optionality now. Um, it won't be as easy as real time or not. Now it's mm, RTP or Fed now or ACH or, you know. Um, so I think that there's there's certainly an opportunity for kind of an optimization story with more optionality for sure. Yeah, we see uh, that happening across the ecosystem. You applied one of, one of the things that Plaid does, we, our goal is to make it easy for our customers to make a connection and then allow them to move the money the way they want to. And if uh, a company doesn't have an ability to move money, we help them with our transfer product or help them introduce them to any number of our uh, our partners who help us move money. And one of these we've seen with, we have over now 50 different partner providers who help our customers move money and that they're thinking a lot about that different orchestration. Some of them are thinking about it in terms of like, not just these bank rails, but how do you, how do you mix and move money in a way that maybe takes advantage of a mix of a cards and bank networks when maybe the bank doesn't work, they can do like an OTP, um, sorry, an OCT on debit, maybe to, to complement that. So like we've seen some really special innovation with uh, a broad base of the the providers on, on the Plaid network as well. All right. So we're going to like talk like a little bit about this like transition into the future. So I think Lily, you're right. Like there's this like there's this messy middle right now that we're in, which is going to like play through with a lot of uh, a lot of different types of people figuring out how to optimize with the different rails that are available in the different contexts or the different consumer connections or the different rails or the different way that they want to move the money fast or slow or also cost layering that into their equation. And coverage won't be determinant and delivery won't be fully determinate. But with the baseline of ACH being there, I think you now have this like flywheel running where people are gonna, people now believe in, in what the future is gonna bring. I wanna do a fun little exercise like for, for, for both of you. Like I'll start with you, Akash. Like 
if you if you imagine waking up in in five or ten years from now, what what do you like? What is your envisioning of how this ultimately does end up? Like, what is your wish list on that, and what problems do you think will be solved? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, in my eyes, a customer or even a business puts in two values. I need to move this much money. This is how fast I need it to get there. Um, and let's throw in a third one. This is how much I'm willing to pay. Similar to that, right? All of those uh, little dotted lines we have, we figure it out, right? The system figures it out. Is this rail working right now? Is, does this fit the cost structure? Uh, is this most optimal, right? Um, so genuinely, it's like a consumer's choice and the pipes just run as smoothly as possible, um, regardless of which one we end up using, I think is what we're looking for, or I would look for. Do you think that's 2029? And do you think that's like 2027? How long, what, how, like how long is the journey to that? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, going back to your previous slide, like interoperability is going to be really big, right? Like, yes, we're creating different rails, um, but they need to speak to one another. And, uh, you know, not knowing how long that's going to take, hopefully that's not uh, that long, but uh, being able to speak to one another and those systems being able to uh, settle with one another is going to be super crucial. Um, so I would hope uh, like 2026, 2027, because uh, we got to get value to customers faster. Oh, I love that optimism. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little more pessimistic, I think. Glass half empty on my side. No, I, I, I think that there's, so my dream, and I imagine, Jay, you were going to ask me the same question, <laughs> but my, my dream here is, um, you know, we know, we, we think we know our customers and we think we know, right. Do we definitely need their inputs? Akash, I think like, you know, what I want to do and when, and what is my, what are the, what is the barriers of what I deem acceptable? A hundred percent, we need those inputs. And I think that, you know, having a bit more interactivity in the customer relationship is fantastic. What I imagine will happen is that we will have, um, a little sort of messy NASCAR slide, at, at, you know, in a in a in a checkout experience or in a payments experience, where we're going to have look at all of these options. You can do all of these things, um, and 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 I think that's good in that I think consumers are are demanding more payment options. They want more payment options. I think I think it was close to fifty percent of consumers said that they want more payment options when they're shopping online, right? And this is in, in a retail use case, but but I think the optionality is still too limited today and we're getting more and more options now and we'll see more and more options being presented where I think things start to get streamlined. So I think by 2029, we'll probably have a lot more options, a lot more folks adopting kind of bank-based payments and real-time payments for those use cases. But I think by 2029, it's going to be still a lot more here, customer, here's all the things you can do. Um, you choose the right path. And then in the future, you know, maybe we'll still have some, 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 you know, uh, parallel arrows in the, in the, in the 2029 timeline. And then past that, we'll have some, you know, more, um, maybe more artificial intelligence, better data science to kind of put things together for them, take more contextual data around what's going on, you know, um, to, to help customers. I think, at the end of the day, and especially in the in the, you know, this this is about um, helping businesses and customers feel more in control of their money, and more visible, and more you know, have more visibility and more awareness about what's going on and where their money is, and that's great for everyone. <laughs> I think two two themes that I like add to this, like one is it, it actually comes Akash, this is probably more in in your world, but. I think we will have, because the real time, because the push rails are like a little bit more in advanced, I think very soon we will see um, incredible choice and flexibility, particularly in things like payroll. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to see be huge benefits of more real time access to funds. I think it like what I get super excited about then is the things that don't exist today that then become enabled by that. So now that people can get real-time access to their payroll or to the to what they earned from what they did, I think that's going to generate entirely new means of employment uh, and entirely new incentive structures for people to contribute more value to society and also like gain more value in, in the work that they do. And I I get excited about that, you know, in the timeline that we have, like in 
uh, within just a, f a few years, I think the use cases themselves will start to to show up on this. And I don't even, it's hard to predict like what those might be, but whenever anything goes from like non-instant to instant or not free to free, things just show up that like are entirely net new, like capabilities in the world. I don't know, Akash, are you seeing any that like, like completely net new businesses that didn't exist now that you're offering you know, this, this futuristic platform? Yeah, man. I, I think that's, you know, when you think about, let's just even take the pandemic, right? It took an event like that where money movement was changing uh, just as much for everyone to be able to start a business, right? You needed, you could incorporate quickly. You could um, essentially start selling some product that you wanted to because everyone was relying on delivery. And we saw a spark in uh, e-commerce types of businesses. And on top of that, now when you include payments, you're talking about, hey, how quickly can I get that money that I have sold to then recycle and then keep playing the same level playing field that I need to do uh, to continue to compete against uh, some of the larger businesses, right? That's how SMBs prosper. Uh, they're taking a little bit of chunk out of the, the big boys. And so uh, definitely, and um, I think you're right. I think there's such a world that the unlock of money movement will create um, that we don't even know yet. And um, it, it's, it's that aspiration or that goal that makes it so exciting. There, I think you're, you're, you guys are right on the money there too. And the, the customer experience, we, we've focused so much on, on kind of customer experience and, and we talk about it a lot because, you know, Forrester talks about customer obsession and, and kind of the age of the customer. Now we're starting to talk more and more about the employee experience and that payroll story or access to funds is, is interesting because, you know, you know, the, the happy, you know, the happy wife, happy life, we've got happy employees, happy customers, right? This idea of better serving our employees to create better customer experiences because our employees are happy and satisfied. And so that, you know, the way if we take a more holistic view as merchants or as billers is how money moves in our organization and, you know, materially impact the customer experience, but it, it's, you know, that that one relationship is just one lens through which we think about money moving and, and you guys are absolutely on the money. I think that in, in some of these other, um, use cases, we'll see, uh, perhaps more, more momentum, uh, in the, in the shorter term. Okay. Well, maybe one of my hopes and aspirations and dreams is that fraud just like magically disappears in the future. Uh, that may not be as realistic as entirely new categories of goods showing up and products showing up. You know, as long as money's uh, been moving, fraud has been a part of the picture. And uh, we really like, you know, we work a lot with our customers as they think about this. So certainly when you're fun, anytime you're moving money, it's like a big factor, you know, and we, you know, on the, on the plaid side, you know, what we've started to see is this, this real network effect taking place. So as our customers, as they, we have almost 10,000 developers now building on plaid, establishing connections to about one in uh, one in four American bank accounts through those connections, then it really creates a data network that is allowing our customers to make sharper and sharper decisions as they uh, as they fight fraud and, and create more certainty in what they're offering to consumers. They do that with like a couple of ways. So on the Plaid stack, right? So there's like an identity risk that they manage, whether it's through our IDV product. We bought a company called Cognito, which is just absolutely world-class in that to uh, the next stage, which is basically account connectivity and account risk. So when someone does connect an account, we have the ability to assess the validity of that connection. It's like essentially, is a, is this Akash the holder of this particular account? Or the, the person with uh, you know ex experience in this particular app, are they truly the same person? And, and, and through that, we develop high, high, high confidence on um, on that initial connection and that 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 front door experience that allows our customers to then onboard people really fast. We've then started to take that one step further into transaction risk. We talked about Signal, which is really you know, our customers can then every time there is a transaction, whether it's a pay-in or even a, we're sorry, whether it's a yeah pay-in or in more and more cases we're seeing like for, for payouts, they can kind of pull the Plaid network to get a sense of the the integrity of that particular type of transaction, the likelihood it returns, the likelihood that it's fraud and, and data elements on there. And then through that, establish an even bigger picture of the, the, the whole risk of the whole network. And so we're seeing a, a really good evolution. Maybe the one thing I'll, I'll say on that, like would maybe fraud is never an easy topic and it, and it is always a challenge and it's a really serious matter across the ecosystem. It's also really a, a, like makes me feel good to see many companies coming together to work 
and and work on this problem together through the network. So we're we're super optimistic on that. I think like um, Akash, I'll go with you first. Like, what what does fraud management mean for your platform and for your customers, and any any trends you're seeing? Yeah. Um, so at the end of the day, like SMBs looking for a Novo checking account, for example, they're expecting their money to be safe, right? Uh, that is like the number one, like my money that I've earned needs to sit in my account that I can use when I need to, right? And um, any money movement involved in there should feel secure and transparent and safe for them. And so, you know, we take fraud extremely seriously and, and some things are in our control and others are not. People are getting, uh, as you mentioned, very creative. Uh, and I know Plaid's playing a big role in, in trying to solve that creativity. Um, but for us, it's, you know, our businesses are interacting with lots of different merchants, lots of lots of different, you know, uh, consumers, purchasers, vendors, contractors, where they don't have the bandwidth and uh, the time to be able to validate everything. Their expectation is that their bank account um, or their partner, their, the financial services company that they're partnering with, can help them with that. And um, that's been the expectation for us for a while. But, you know, money movement is super important. It's these edge cases when fraud does happen that make it so difficult. Um, and that's when you start to lose the trust of your, you know, consumer or your business. And uh, once you lose trust, it's pretty hard to bring it back. And uh, so we take it very, very seriously. And, and these products definitely help. Really? Yeah. I mean, this is this is um, this is this is a really really tough area and one that is so um, divisive at the moment and 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 interesting because. In, in on the one hand, a lot of our fraud tools are working really, really well, um, right? We, on the merchant side, on the banking side, uh, the fraud management is always this pendulum swing, right? Where, you know, you've, you've got really, really good controls. Well, the fraudsters are gonna find the weakest link, right? And and move there. And then, and I think right now with with bank-based payments and and certainly in with the irrevocability of of RTP and FedNow, we've got um, more of an emphasis on on uh, on really ensuring that these are the right actors. Um, and unfortunately, so Forrester kind of predicts that that push-based fraud, so consumer-initiated uh, payments, will have uh, like double-digit growth in 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 fraud because. Our merchant tools are working well. Our banking fraud tools are working well, and fraudsters are going to the consumers with these like social engineering attacks, to to you know pretending to be reputable retailers, um, really convincing you know kind of scary phone calls or convincing emails, and 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 especially when this is a um, you know banks have sort of been unprepared for this push-based fraud, right? When, you know, they're, they're very, very reticent when they're sort of, um, tr you know, they're, they're controlling kind of transaction risk and transaction fraud quite well. But when we think about kind of the uh, identity risk or the, the authentication risk, and when this is a customer who's saying, yeah, I want to move money out of this account, you know, um, we're, we're, we're sort of like, okay, right? So, so the challenge with this, I think, is A, fraudsters are certainly following you know they're they're following the the this puck they know where this is going they know customers are going to um participate in this activity more right this push based payment this bank based payment and they they know it they're there they're capitalizing and taking advantage of it and then the risk akash you nailed it right that the risk is that then we have scarred tissue, we have lack of trust, we have bad experiences, and we won't uh, engage in that again, because we're just too scared, it's just too messy. In fact, we this is, I think, a big risk if we were to create kind of a SWAT of this in in kind of the emergence and growth of bank-based payments and, and real-time payments is, we've got to really nail this, right? We really got to get the fraud management down, because if consumer this is a, a real risk to consumers to continue to engage in this behavior if we don't figure this out um because it's a it's an it's an issue it's a big problem super important and i think it's uh it is going to be always evolving i think yeah one scene that's like really exciting to see is like banks companies networks are thinking like a couple steps ahead and they're doing keep thinking a couple steps ahead together so it's, and you know i look what some cases such as Zelle, I think they they caught the industry a little bit 
they've, the, the product itself kind of moved faster than anybody did. And I think we all caught up in a lot of ways, but really looking ahead and looking not just in the future where things may be going, but also actually like we're looking where the money might be le like leading. And that's what we see like this push based kind of fraud intelligence is one thing definitely we're seeing. All right. This brings us to, uh, to the, to the end. And, and so like as a wrap up, I'd love us to like decide together, like what are, what's like, what are, one, maybe two things that we want folks to really take away from, from this discussion. Like what would be your one kind of uh, key point for folks to, to take away with? Akash, what's your, what do you recommend? Yeah, I think it's, uh, look, speed is, speed is everything. And it's, it's becoming more and more apparent, right? Like the end goal is this optimal speed uh, that we're, that the rails are starting to create. Um, how we get there, is going to be messy. Uh, I think like that's one big thing that's uh, very apparent to me, but we're going to get there. And I think like that's what brings the optimism um, to the future of what we can unlock with faster money movement. I think I, um, it, it, yes, and so co-sign that. And also um, I'm really interested in the varied use cases. So even in industries that have kind of ignored bank-based payments in the past, right? We saw um, sort of Amazon announce their partnership with Venmo and the, the kind of drawing more and more of it, this kind of bank-based payment activity in, in sectors and in industries that have kind of ignored it in the past, right? So I'm really interested to see um, how we, and you know, acknowledge that customers want optionality in their payment methods. They want um, and recognize, you know, our financial lives are much more complicated than our payments infrastructure sort of considers today. So, um, I'm. I think the big takeaway here is more options are coming. The use cases are growing. This is something to certainly start thinking about and start planning and start. You know, we we talk about the kind of fintechification of of customer relationships um, and, and looking at that money movement uh, within the business, even from, you know, the, the traditional kind of reason you're in business, right, to accept payments from these consumers or whatever. Um, but think about all the ways in which money moves and, and identify those use cases where, where real time or that immediacy actually provides that material benefit uh, coupled with that that really important point that we just went over, which is, you know, mitigating the the fraud risk um, from the beginning. Yeah. If I would stitch this together with what you both said, I think there's like, there is just an inevitability of what we're building towards. And I do agree with your compassion. It's like speed and the, the speed ties to everything, which is like the confidence in the rails to the trust that needs to be built into it. But it is going to, it is truly inevitable that we will see uh, a true native bank-based world that moves instantly. And I think like tying in Lily, your point is like, it's gonna get there because of this flywheel effect and consumer expectations tying into more use cases that then companies are spending more time on, on both sides, whether it's paying in or paying out. And that flywheel effect is gonna like carry us through to this inevitable uh, like outcome. And like you said, it's, a, it's gonna be a, a transition. And so, but like at the end of the day, when we kind of think about what we're working towards, it is an inevitable future that we can kind of envision in our heads and we'll see it take place through this flywheel of what we're all working towards together. Hey, uh, this brings us to our, to the end. Uh, both of you, I learned so much, not just today, but in general, and I just appreciate um, all, all that we've been able to cover uh, in this conversation. I hope we do it again. And we'll check back in, hopefully at Kosh before your 2027 timeline. Uh, and <laughs> Let's see if the optimism or the pessimism wins out. <laughs> but I really appreciate it and look forward to hearing from, from uh, both of you in the future and then also from folks watching this. If folks have uh, ideas and uh, want to reach out, I think uh, folks can, can find us uh, on their social network or other way of their choice. And uh, let's look forward to seeing this inevitable future that we're working towards. Yeah. Thank Thanks so much. Again, guys. Yeah. Take care. Wonderful right. job. There you go. <laughs> you guys did great. That was cool. awesome. Yeah, that was really good. Uh, I felt like I was watching one of those like very interesting podcasts where it's just a conversation.